uh, welcome everybody. I'm really happy to see the uh, number of participants today. Uh, our speaker today is Fabrice Cordelier. He will um, present the, uh, an introduction to co-localization. Fabrice is working at the Bordeaux Imaging Center. It's a microscopy facility in France. And uh, we as panelists, so Rocco D'Antuono, Kurt Anderson, Romain Guillet, uh, Thibault Lagache, Anna, Clem, and me, uh, we as panelists are here to answer all your questions from the Q&A and moderate the session. So don't be shy, ask your question. We will also interrupt Fabrice if needed to ask some questions to him and he will make some breaks. So we are here together for one hour 30 webinar and the floor is yours, Fabrice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to give you this really short introduction about co-localization. I won't go into, into fancy advanced uh, topics. I will just try to see, to, to show you the basic tools that you can use and the basic elements that you can use to build your own workflow of co-localization. Of course, there are a lot of methods depending on the topic you're working on. But my idea here with this first introductory uh, seminar is really to uh, revisit the generic methods and to try to, to make you understand what is behind, how to use them, how to combine them, and how to, to, to play and get significant numbers out of, uh, of your images. So let's dive into, uh, into this uh, this black box that is colocalization. And everything is always starting with uh, an image. And I really like to use this image that is from, uh, from, from the, the Fiji website. This is a, a, a nice image um, with uh, two channels, one red and one green. And everyone knows that when you're looking at colocalization, what you're expecting is to see some yellow dots, some uh, yellow areas. And if your monitor, if your screen is not uh, that good, and if the compression about the network is not that good, you may see that we've got indeed some areas, some yellowish areas here. So why should we bother and why should we try to quantify this colocalization? Because we, we, we see it. Yeah, but once more, depending on on the means to display the, the image and so on, uh, you may be tricked into thinking that uh, you've got indeed colocalization. So you, you may think this is an obvious, obvious problem, but when zooming a bit, you will realize that the two signals are indeed separated. So this is why it's important to look at the image. This is a starting point, especially to identify the areas where, where you may have colocalization, but then it will be important to find a way to measure and to assess that indeed your diagnosis of colocalization is, is, is true. But the problem is, and th this is a problem that I come across quite, quite a lot working on a facility. The, the problem is that colocalization encompasses quite a lot of different things, different topics. And in fact, colocalization is some kind of big word that encompasses several uh, typical experimental situations. When the user crosses the door here on the facility, sometimes he or she is, she is expecting colocalization, but in fact, he or she is expecting some kind of co-expression, which means that you see in this example, uh, with, a, with a single cell, with two labelings, one in the nucleus and the other one in uh, the cytoplasm, you will never see these yellowish dots. And the user will ask for colocalization when the thing that he is looking for is co-expression. So two proteins located in the same structure, in the same cell. So already at this step, you see that there is one thing that matters the resolution and the, the, the topology of where the event is taking place in here, what you are expecting is two signals not to be at the same location as you would expect when talking about colocalization, but you're expecting the two proteins to be in the same, in, in the same structure. 
all in the same cell. Then what you may expect is some kind of co-occurrence, meaning that the two proteins are of interest are on the same, on the same spot, in this, on the same structure, on the same location, but without having a specific stoichiometry of association. You may have uh, one green for two reds, and in another structure, you may have two, two reds for four greens, and, uh, and so on. So in this case, you're indeed expecting a co-occurrence in the same structure, but no real relationship in terms of intensity. If you're expecting a certain stoichiometry of association to the structure, you will rather be looking for correlation, correlation of intensity of the two labelings on structures of interest. And finally, sometimes what you want to see, you want to see if the, the patterns of distribution of the proteins are, are, are somehow related. And in this case, you will rather talk about co-distribution. So of course, depending on what you want to do, you may use certain tools. Co-occurrence will use some tools that are not the ones that you will use for correlations. This is, one you've, this is why you've got a huge panel of tools that you, you will take benefit of. And then you will try, you will start your journey into the colocalization analysis world. And um, to, for, for the purpose of this talk, I, I've been separating this journey into, into five big steps. Checking data integrity, then pre-processing, then choosing a reporter or metric, then comparing and interpreting, and finally, assembling the workflow as you've been establishing which tools, which elements you will assemble. First, let's have a look at how we check for the da data integrity. Because already when uh, preparing the sample, you can totally screw your colocalization analysis. Already when you're acquiring the data, you can screw your uh, colocalization analysis. So, there are three main points that you should take care of, and we will see which uh, important steps we should go through. First, of course, you will have to choose dyes that you can image separately. Uh, if you're looking for colocalization and you're really not choosing the dyes you're using well to, to uh, if, if you are not choosing the appropriate dyes that will be easy to separate when doing the imaging, then you may come across some troubles like having a bit of one channel uh, um, going into bleeding through the other channel. And this is quite easy to assess simply by using this uh, representation. I hope that we see the pointer on the, on the screen. Uh, by doing this kind of, of plot where you will use the two intensity for the same pixel, the green intensity and the red intensity as coordinates, x, y coordinates, and you will plot it on this kind of diagram, which is called the cycle diagram. So if you're, lo if you're looking for colocalization, what you will see is a big, and if the intensities are linked between the two channels, you will see a big cloud, more or less compact uh, on, on the graph. If you have some bleed through from one channel to another, you will see some kind of relationship between the two, uh, the two sets of intensities quite close from the axis. And this should be a sign that maybe your acquisition parameters or the choice in the dice are not really appropriate and you may go back to the bench or to the microscope to, to do better acquisition or better prep. The other thing, of course, is you're imaging. You're imaging several dyes through your microscope, and a microscope has some kind of defects. Of, uh, of course, even if you're using the best objectives and so on, you may uh, have images where the, the channels you're imaging are not well registered. And in this case, you should, you, you should absolutely, before starting to measure anything, to do the colocalization, you must assess that your setup is really 
uh, appropriate and co that co-registration occurs. If it's not the case, then you may try to uh, analyze this non-co-registration and try to correct for that. And one way to do it is to use some reference objects that you know that are multi-labeled. You acquire them in the same situation as your uh, sample and you check if everything is well uh, well aligned, well co-registered, co registered and then maybe go back to the microscope and try to fix the things or simply characterize and correct, which is something that we'll, uh, I will talk about in the pre-processing uh, step. Finally, finally um, resolution is really important. You, you should know at which resolution you're working. You should know the limits of your microscope because of course, if you're taking the crappiest objective on the facility, if you're uh, using a simple magnifying glass, of course, everything will colocalize. So word of advice, if you want to prove that there is colocalization, just use the magnifying glass. It will be easier. Uh, but uh, okay, when you're, you're going for a diagnosis of colocalization, this diagnosis is for a specific resolution. In fact, and this is a bit hard uh, for a biologist to, to understand it. It doesn't mean that because you find colocalization, the two proteins are actually at the same place. In fact, the true, uh, the true conclusion of the colocalization test will be uh, knowing the current resolution, I can't exclude that indeed the two proteins are at the same location in the same surrounding. So this is why it's important to using some reference slides, some reference beads to measure this resolution. And when publishing, always say, okay, I've been doing colocalization tests at that resolution. Of course, with the, with, with the expansion of uh, the new method, the new super resolutive methods, you now see that the two proteins that were colocalizing are not colocalizing anymore. This is not that the previous pa paper was wrong. It's just that the technology has evolved and the resolution ha has improved. And now you can separate the, your proteins of interest. So this is, it's really important to always uh, do the three steps, choose the dice well, uh, check for core registration, and finally assess your resolution so that you can state it when publishing. Uh, sometimes I see users coming to the facility with images that are not really, really good for colocalization. And unfortunately, in most of the cases, there is not that much we can do. Uh, image processing is not a, a magic wand. You can't, uh, you, you, you can't really uh, improve the images afterwards, or you can do it, but in, in, in a limited thing. And it's always best to have the best samples the best acquisitions before jumping to the next step, which will deal with the image processing, the pre-processing, and choosing and applying a, a metric. So these are the, some of the commandments that we should, we should apply. You should, you should apply, you should, you should choose your dice well, know your microscopes and its limitation, use appropriate sampling, of course, uh, take benefit of the full dynamic range, especially if you're, uh, you want to work on coincidence or correlation between intensities, avoid saturation, or, or of course, you shall go back to your bench and talk to your facility people. Now, questions so far? Yes, Fabrice, uh, at least um, I think one is really interesting right now is uh, how to check properly uh, about sub true and can it be done with control samples? That's what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is one way one way to do it. Uh, of course, this is something that people tend to to skip, but having mono labeled samples is is something that is really important. This way, it will allow you first. To, to, to check if you've got bleed through and 
potentially do some la like in uh, flow cytometry where you do some some kind of gating compensations and, and so on but well if you already on the sample you already have a, a evident bleed through maybe maybe try to separate a bit more choose dyes that are spectrally more separated but sometimes you don't have the choice so you will try to compensate Although, yeah. uh, no other question right now, um, one we need to clarify anyway. But regarding the bleed through, would you recommend to always work on, um, let's say, sequential acquisition mode or always then? I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's, it's uh, it, once more, the, the, the main answer that I will, uh, I will give is it depends, it depends. For instance, if you're working on fixed samples, yeah, yeah, you've got the time. So take the time and do some sequential uh, acquisitions. If you're in live mode and uh, you've got something that is moving fast within a cell, a vesicle or whatever, uh, of course, this, this, this will be a, a trade-off. So, yeah. Okay, um, thanks. Maybe you can continue. Okay. Okay, about pre-processing. So as I told you, uh, we will do, uh, we have f at least four phases of four ways, four meanings for a single word, colloquialization. Um, and of course, we may want to work on objects and coincidence of objects or coincidence of intensities. And this is this is the nature of the image. An image, an image is is a support carrying some information, and you've got several types of information within a single image. An image is, of course, a collection of pixels, and you may want to work on the intensities to see if there is some kind of coincidence of intensities, some kind of correlation of intensities. It's also a collection of frequencies. I won't go into details about collection of frequency, but uh, you've got some, uh, this, is, this is one way to perceive an, an image. An image is also a collection of objects and we can work on the coincidence of objects, but we must first define what is an object. And sometimes the object that the image is, uh, is, is carrying, the, the image, the, the, the objects, they are small enough so that you can summarize them, extract one point of interest. This could be the center of the structure. The structure is close to the resolution. So this is another way. And this opens some additional methods about how to uh, assess colocalization. And nowadays, now that we, are, we have access to super resolution, an image is not an image anymore. Uh, you will extract a list of detection, a list of events from which you can go back to a collection of objects. And we will see with some examples later uh, about what, what I'm, I'm talking about right now. Let's go into, into the pre-processing. I've been talking about bleed through and crosstalk. And if you don't have any other mean, uh, if you can't go back to the bench, if you can't uh, go back to the microscope, or if you, if you optimize the full process and you can't improve anymore, there are ways to try to correct for bleed through and crosstalk for, for one channel going into the other or for uh, a single uh, light source exciting the two uh, the two uh, dyes at the same time. This is called spectral deconvolution, but in fact I will rather use spectral and mixing. There are some nice plugins that do, do the job, but in, of course you will have to have some references to know how much one channel is bleeding into into the other and the reverse way way round. About the chromatic shift, if you have the uh, misregistration between the, the two channels, 
of course, a simple translation can correct, but once more, when correcting over the image, keep in mind that you're correcting uh, at the pixel level, not, you won't be able to, to correct uh, at a sub pixel level unless you're doing some kind of approximation about the distribution of intensities and, and so on. You will have to do some interpolation, which may impair later on the, the processing. About corrections, sometimes you've got a low signal, you've got a high background, a lot of noise on the image. And in that case, using some kind of filtering or denoising could help. But be careful when using uh, filtering, linear or, or rank filtering, of course you will impair, you will modify the intensity that you're working on. So if you're, you want to assess a correlation between intensities, then this, this, this will be a problem. And about denoising, once more, don't use it as a black box. Try to understand what is behind so that you, you don't create additional artifacts. I've been talking about resolution and sometimes you're missing a bit of resolution. And in this kind of situation, of course, deconvolution could be, could, could be a, a pre-processing method of, of choice. As long as you're sure that the PSF is not changing too much of, of all the field of the uh, acquisition and in, depth, in the depths of the acquisition. Be careful about, uh, about um, the, the algorithm that you're, you're choosing. It should be conservative to have exactly the same intensities, but distributed in a, in a different way. So be careful. Once more, the convolution is not to be used as a black box, but it can restore a bit of your uh, resolution. And nowadays, machine learning is also a way to do a bit of restoration of our, the image. But keep in mind, uh, this question is the processing changing the intensity, the intensities. The, if so, be careful when using correlation between between intensities. Uh, if you're missing a bit of resolution, of course you may ask um, help from a friend, and this friend is could be called super resolution. If you're missing resolution, just try to push it. You've got expansion microscopies. This could be also uh, a different method to, to try and, and to, to try to improve uh, your resolution. Finally, if you're planning to work on the objects, you must, from the image, define what is an object, what is a background, and group the pixels that are part of the object uh, into the actual objects. Uh, but before the, the first step, so differentiating the objects from the background pixels, how do you do that? Do you do a simple threshold? Do you do some adapt adaptative or local threshold? Well, is it good to work on the signal you're trying to quantify and try to isolate the structures from this signal, running the risk to get rid of part of the signal? These are questions that you should ask yourself. And I will invite you to go to the YouTube channel and to see Kota Murat's talk about where, where he's talking about, um, uh, 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 about, uh, about this kind of, uh, of topics, not only, but about this kind of, uh, of topics. Then, of course, you will have to isolate and delineate the objects. You will have to group the objects the, the pixels into objects. This is the connexity analysis. Maybe you would like to work rather on contours, so you will have to work on snakes to try to isolate the contours. Once you have the objects, maybe the thing you would like to do is, if you, especially if you've got some really small objects relative to the resolution, you may try to, you may want to work not on the objects directly, but summarize the objects as points of interest, for instance, the centers. And I will show you some method that work on that. And the opposite way around is true. When you've got points, detections, like in super resolution, do you want to work directly on the detections or maybe do first a distillation to, to, to have these ties that then you can try to work on? This is a, a question that should be addressed. So pre-processing, 
you've got corrections to try to revert the problem that you may have when acquiring the data. You've got restoration to try to improve, to push a bit further on the resolution to, to get a grasp at the resolution that is in the image but that required some processing to, 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 to get um, onto your image. And finally, if you're planning to work on the images, you've got to do some segmentation. But how? This, uh, these are the, the questions to, to ask. Questions so far? Do you have questions or should I jump to? Uh, is there, there is a couple of questions uh, that maybe you can, uh, you can answer. I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, to mute. I'm in an open office. Um, <laughs> sorry. So there is a question regarding the unmixing, spectral unmixing. Um, can it be can it be used to help uh, to solve the blitz through problem, or is that another problem? It, it can be used to try to revert the blitz through, but you've got to make sure that the uh, you've got uh, references that were done in the same situation. And once more, once more, this shouldn't be something that you, you use first. First, you should try to improve the sample prep and to improve the way you acquire the images. And if you are still stuck there, you've been asking the help from the facility staff and so on, then maybe try this. But once more, it's, it's better to have, I, I do, this is personal preference, but I do prefer to start colocalization analysis with really the, the, the data as raw as possible. If you are starting to process and to over process, then you must check that the processing that you're, you're putting into the workflow is not uh, adding additional stuff uh, that will le lead to uh, over estimation of the colocalization. Another interesting question. Actually, it's uh, quite frequent within the question. It's about how to use control. Uh, some people drop thresholds and so on. I, I guess that's what you will cover in, in the next uh, minutes. So maybe it's not necessary to, to talk much about it. But there is one question that I think is really interesting is um, what do you do with your control images? Do you have to show them, uh, for example, in your, in your manuscript? Well, uh, if you want my opinion, this should be this should be part of the data set that you you release together with the with the manuscript, and you you link uh, and so on. But in practice, how many PI do care about having all the controls? Uh, how many PI will agree to have an additional, let's say, two or three pages? in the manuscript uh, with controls, because who cares about the controls after all? It's a good question. <laughs> so this is, this is why uh, making all the data sets for one study available, publicly available, applying the FAIR uh, principle and so on, making all this available would be would be the best this way if it's not in the paper at least you can find it somewhere you can review the controls you can review everything and make sure that what is that you agree with what has been published are we good i think we're good for the moment there is more controversial questions that we may cover at the end when you will have uh, yeah cover uh, your content i think okay Okay, now you've got your images. Uh, they, are, they have been acquired the best way as possible. Maybe you've been processing them just a bit, just a tiny bit to correct a few things. And now comes the moment where you've got to choose a reporter, a metric. And so um, we, with uh, Susan Bolt, and others have been trying to separate, to, to categorize the reporters and the metric. And here is one way we, we present the thing. And this might be a bit controversial, but okay. Let's 
let's assume that we've got uh, a set of reporters and we want to uh, split them into two groups. The thing that we do is by looking at what exists, what has been published, uh, I would say that you've got two big families of reporters or metrics. You've got the indicators on one, on one side and on the other side, you've got quantifiers. So indicators is a number, a number and a scale. And you put this number over the scale with minimum colocalization, maximum colocalization, and in between values. This is just an indication. And it works really well when you've got several experimental conditions because you will be able to compare them. But having only one value, it will be complicated unless you're on one side or the other side of the scale. So you will need to find tricks and we will see in the, in the, in, in the next part, uh, the tricks when you've got only one single experimental condition. So these are the indicators on the one, on one side. About quantifiers, quantifiers are a bit easier to understand because they will rely on physical uh, parameters. For instance, you will try with quantifiers to um, define the level of overlap between two structures. So the percentage, let's say, of the area that is involved in the colocalization uh, process or the percentage of the volume that is involved in the colocalization uh, process. Or maybe the distances between sets of coordinates and try to see the percentage of those sets of coordinates that from one channel to another lie behind the resolution uh, limit. So of course, quantifiers will rely more on physical uh, parameters, physical descriptors. So you will have a direct readout. For the indicators, you have to have the scale and you have to have several values to compare. To compare. So, but enough categories, let's jump into, uh, into the, the generic indicator that everyone is using. Let's talk a bit about Pearson correlation coefficient. Okay, this might be scary and you can skip it. Well, um, you just have to keep in mind that the Pearson coefficient is simply, uh, simply uh, an indicator on how well the cytofluorogram, where you've got intensities from channel one and channel two serving as coordinates, you, it will define how well the cloud of dots here looks like a line. If you take twice the same image and try to compute the Pearson coefficient, you will have something that is close to one. If you have two signals that are separated, first, on the side of your program, you will see one cloud here, another cloud there, and no real relationship between the two. You will have an exclusion and a Pearson coefficient close to minus one. If you don't have any correlation, then the dot cloud will be spread everywhere and the Pearson coefficient will be zero. So, and I think this has raised some kind of controversy, but I personally find it hard to interpret when you've got a value alone that is far from one minus one or zero. Uh, I find it quite hard to, to interpret alone. Of course, if I've got several experimental situation, drug, no drug, and I compare the, the two situations, of course, I will position the two values and be able to say, yeah, I've got more colocalization here than there. But if I've got only one value, and this value is far away from the well-identified three values, I find it hard to, to interpret. Of course, when using the Pearson correlation coefficient, 
you're comparing your dot cloud to a single line, which makes it hard to use when, for instance, you've got, let's say, let's imagine a receptor and a ligand for the receptor. Uh, of course, there, there is a moment where you will have enough ligand going into the receptor and then you will have the receptor saturated. So you will have co-localization up to a certain level where you will reach a plateau. So when the, the, the shape of the curve won't be a line, and in this kind of situation, the Pearson co correlation coefficient won't be good, the, the, the appropriate one to, to use. And this is where the Sperman's coefficient uh, comes into play. Basically, the thing you will do, so you see, when you've got something where you've got saturation that happens, saturation at the biological level, not over the image, you will have this kind of curve. So comparing it to a linear distribution is, is not something that is uh, relevant. This is where the Sperman's coefficient comes into play, where instead of having the single intensity values, you will replace each single value by its rank. And by doing that, you will linearize the curve and you will be able to apply the Pearson coefficient that we've seen earlier. Of course, the condition to be able to apply this coefficient is that you don't have a curve that does something, some, some kind of wavy pattern. The, it should go up, it should go down, but it should be, it should go in only one direction to, to, be, to, to be applied. So many other indicators exist. Some have been engineered so that instead of having a range between minus one to plus one, you've got a range between zero and one, which makes it a bit confusing because sometimes people will use some of the coefficients that are between zero and one and relate them to a percentage of co-localization, which is not exactly uh, the case and not always the, the case. So quantifiers now, and of course you all know about the Manders coefficient. Manders coefficient is, uh, I've been trying to summarizing the, the principle here. You've got a structure that is labeled in red, another one in green, and you've got an overlap here. You will collect the intensities within the overlap region, and those intensities, you will divide them by the total intensity of our, the red channel. This will give you the M1 uh, coefficient. In fact, it will, the M1 coefficient is just the, the quantity of material that is engaged into the percentage of the material that is engaged in the process of co-localization. M2 is exactly the same, but the reverse rate round, so for the other channel. Oops. And so already here, you've got this, this kind of measurement, and you've got um, some kind of a value that, is, that you can uh, really interpret alone. But of course, if you've got, and I hope that you have several experimental conditions, this is even better because you can position them one relative to the other. You've got a derivative from the Manders coefficient where instead of looking at the percentage of signal that is engaged in the colocalization process, you will have a look at the surface or the volume that is engaged into this, this process. And once more, Having one value is, is okay because you will be able to, to have an absolute value, but having multiple experimental conditions is, is even, uh, even better. I've been talking earlier about small objects, really small objects that, are, that have a size, an overall size that is close to the optical resolution. If you've got two tiny dots close to the optical resolution, and you're trying to measure an overlap between the two using the Manders coefficient, of course, this won't make sense 
you won't have enough pixels to define a precise percentage of overlap. And you will have extreme values if you've got nine pixels on one side and nine pixels on the other side, the overlap can take only few of the, 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 the possible values, one third, uh, one sixth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it will be difficult to use this kind of method, the Manders coefficient on really small objects. This is why it, it's okay to try to summarize the problem by isolating the small objects and maybe summarizing them with one set of coordinates with the center of mass or the, 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 the geometrical center of the objects. And once we have this summarized version of the objects, we can do several things. We can define a rule. We can define our own metric about what is colocalization. Let's assume that we've got uh, these two objects and we, we just check for the center of the red object. We could set up a rule saying, I consider that there is co-localization when the center of the red channel, the, the object on the red channel, is falling onto the green object. So in that case, of course, we don't have co-localization here. In this situation where you, we have a plain red circle, uh, which is perfectly centered over the green object, then of course its center is falling onto the green object and I consider that there is co-localization. And now com comes a specific situation where I've got a ring that is perfectly well centered over the green uh, object. The center of the red ring will fall onto the green object. And I will conclude about co-localization. And this is at this step that you realize that maybe, maybe in the workflow, even if it's not appropriate to measure the overlap, maybe uh, having a look at how the overlap behaves in combination with this method will allow me to go even further in the conclusion. I don't see much overlap between the ring and the circle, which means that they might be separated. But when using this strategy here, I see that the center is falling onto the green object, which surely means that the red signal is outside of the green uh, signal. So you see that by, and this is quite important, by going into the colocalization black box, understanding all the methods and so on, you may start to think about additional ways to, um, to analyze your data, maybe combine several methods that will give you one focus that will allow you to conclude about what's going on in your, in your sample. Yeah, on the previous slide, I've been only summarizing one object by its center. Here, I will use the center for both channels. And now I will set up a simple rule. If the two crosses are separated by a distance that is less than the resolution, then I can't exclude that the two objects, the two centers, are co-localized. So you see, it, it makes some weird things because uh, if you've been applying the right sampling rate, you may have two crosses that are separated one from the other, but if the distance is below the optical resolution, the two crosses will actually co-localize. And it's, it's weird, it's, it goes against the principle that to have co-localization, you should have yellow when merging red and, uh, and green. So in this kind of situation, we are above the resolution, so we don't have co-localization, even if we have a bit of overlap. Here, we still have co-localization. And once more, with the ring and the circle, we, we have co-localization. Do we have 
questions at this step? Oh, we certainly have questions. Um, no, but it's really interesting. Uh, some of them are very, very specific. And uh, since I don't know exactly what you will cover, it's a bit difficult to uh, to decide. But for example, I will take one um, about the Mendes coefficients. What do you recommend on choosing a ROI, yes, no, and how to subtract background and, how, and what to use as control? Mendes seems highly sensitive to the choices. And the thing is, on, on each of the method you, uh, you, you presented briefly, I think we can make uh, an OBS Academy event of at least one or two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, the problem is uh, this kind of que this kind of question, and I, I'm not skipping the question, but it all depends on uh, the biological problem you're working on. It all depends on the nature of the noise you're working on, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't have a precise answer except uh, once more go to your facility people and try to get. Uh, advices from your facility people because well if you've got noise you can always try to filter to denoise uh, and so on if you don't have a way to improve the sample and the acquisition about uh, region of interest um, about region of interest yeah uh, on the menders it all depends on the on the distribution of your structures, so uh, I couldn't, I could, I couldn't uh, say. <laughs> uh, on on this region of interest, uh, I can comment with one project we had, uh, where you have cells that have uh, different phenotypes, and basically, if you look at the overall image, you might not see something, but if you uh, do the analysis cell per cell, then you see that you have a difference of uh, phenotypes between um, cells and you end up with a difference in your results. But it's more tedious because now you have to find the region of interest. And at the same time, if you're, if you, if you're thinking that maybe the Mendel's coefficient may depend from one region of your cell to another, the thing that I would recommend is maybe try to measure object per object and then try to make a map where you color, you make a color map of the overlap between your objects. And maybe you will see some region that are homogeneous with a certain percentage of overlap, other with a, another one, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to learn about that, <laughs> if you want to, because this will require a bit of automation, but if you want to learn about that, we've got an excellent set of videos about an introduction to the macros with Fiji on our YouTube channel. Um, all the questions, you, you might answer them uh, later. Uh, it's about uh, 3D versus 2D and about the software that exists for colocalization. Okay, so uh, 2D versus 3D. Uh, of course, if you can go for 3D, go for 3D. Because, because the biology is not 2D anymore, it's, it's 3D, so uh, gone. J just try to imagine if you've got um, a colocalization that is taking place along the z-axis, okay? Red, green, okay? And if I slice just here, what will I conclude? This object is alone. So you can't, uh, unless, unless you're forced to, and. Uh, uh, but please go 3D. About, uh, about softwares, okay. Well, I'm the author of this plugin, which is called Jakob. And I insist on the Jakob because it was written with a German, uh, my German colleague, and JA is Ja in, uh, in German. So it's just another colloquialization plugin, Jakob. But, well, it's not that I don't want to recommend it. It's just that it depends on what you want to do and how much you want to go into automation and so on. So depending on if the method is there, go for, for it. If you're using IC, you've got additional plugins. And if you're writing your full workflow in IC, have a look at the, at the tools. I, I, I refuse to give you advices 
on 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 the tools because there are many out there and there there are many that are really good it all depends on your full workflow and how you can integrate and jump from one tool to another and maybe you want to 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 get stuck into into image fj or maybe you want to go to ic in that case explore what is there and uh, and uh, have fun yeah i think we'll have to uh let's say to to com to complete these kind of questions on the image forum uh, on the yeah. thread we'll have uh, let's say uh, a complete list of software we are um, often using or recommending yeah and uh, and don't despair if you see that we we are not answering your questions. It's also that sometimes, uh, I mean, in the Q and A window, it sometimes it's really difficult to make something that will be less than one thousand words. So, <laughs> and uh, about the software, I will come to the softwares. I, I will give yeah. I I, I will do auto prom promotion for one chapter, one review uh, chapter at the end where we have. A table with depending on what you want to do the kind of software that exist okay great okay about comparing and interpreting now um, well you will have to do a lot of statistics you will you would have to first plan your experiments to know how many cells how many objects etc etc and to be honest I was trained as a biologist I'm now a bioimage analyst and statistics is not something that I really master. So the advice once more would be to get help about statistics, get help from people who, who, who know uh, how to, to do them. In France, we have had a, a really nice training which is called Image Stats, in, uh, in, uh, Statistics for Images and where we have been able, uh, thanks to the organizers, to, um, to, to, to have a look at what is an experimental plan on a statistical point of view. And I can tell you that it's better to go ask them before you start your, your full experiment, because these are the questions that we always get. How many cells, how many objects, uh, which condition, which test, etc., etc. This is not the kind of thing that personally uh, I feel confident to, to, to tell you, to, to, to explain to you. But I can show you all the tools before or after the, this discussion to, to give them material that they can use. I've been talking about uh, comparing and the problem that I personally found with indicators. Uh, if I've got only one experimental condition. So how, from one experimental condition, can I put some kind of diagnosis of colocalization when I, I've got only one value? Well, I need to generate additional values, additional uh, metrics. And one way is simply, um, simply to, to take one data set, my only data set, well, I hope that in this kind of situation, I had several images of the same experimental condition uh, where I will establish the person coefficient between channel A and channel B. I will have a certain value. And you see that this is typically the kind of mid-range value that I find personally hard to interpret. How do I do to get something to compare it to? Maybe I take exactly the same data set at least for one channel. And I use a second channel, but rotate it by 90 degrees and try to see what is the person, uh, Pearson coefficient, correlation coefficient. And I see a huge drop, which means that, yeah, I surely had something there. So this is one way um, to do it. Of course, if, if, if the image is crowded with the signal, just Flipping one image, it, it won't be enough because you will always have some kind of random uh, co correlation between the two signals. So, but if you've got some sparse objects, this is one way to generate the second data set from the original one. Then there are methods that have been engineered uh, well 
simple methods where simply you will take the original data set, but you will displace one channel. You will translate one channel relative to the other. And I don't know if this will be uh, visible on the webcam, but the thing I like to do when I'm explaining this von Stinsel approach is taking my two hands like that. Okay, channel A, channel B. When they are overlapping, I've got maximum of correlation, maximum expectable uh, uh, correlation. And now if I translate one relative to the other, I will progressively lose the correlation. I will do it in one way, in the other way, and each time, each time I'm translating one image relative to the other, I'm computing the Pearson coefficient. And then I'm plotting this series of Pearson coefficient relative to this translation. If I had first colocalization, then by shifting, I will lose the uh, correlation. If to the opposite, I started with exclusion, when I'm shifting, I'm running the chance to have uh, an overlap when translating. So depending on the shape of the curve that you have at the end, you may say, yeah, I started with colocalization and then I've lost it. So this is indeed colocalization. One additional thing with the Van Stinsel approach, which is nice, if you have some chromatic aberration, the maximum won't be at zero. It will be slightly shifted. The width of the curve, of course, depends on the size of the structure. If I've got two fingers, it's easy to lose the correlation. If I've got a finger like that and another one like that, I should move quite a lot in order to lose the correlation. So this is what this will make a bigger bell shape. Finally, uh, a third strategy uh, to try to generate something to compare your value to is to randomize. You will take one of the two images, you will cut it, cut this image into small blocks, taking into consideration that um, due to the way the image is formed, you've got a local correlation between intensities. This is due to the point spread function of your optical system. So the bricks that you will make in your image are a bit bigger than one pixel. In general, if you've been applying the right sampling, it will be three by three pixels. So you cut this image into small pieces, you put all the pieces in a bag, you shake the bag, and then you just get pieces and reassemble them into a new image. This gives you something that on a biological sense doesn't have any sense, but at least this is exactly the same information, but located uh, differently. And now the thing you will do is compare this randomized green image to the red channel. You will compute the Pearson coefficient. You will do it once, twice, a lot of times, and then you will end up with a big distribution of Pearson coefficient to which that this corresponds to situation where colocalization may have uh, happened, but on a random basis. And now the thing you will do is take back the two original images and compare the Pearson coefficient that you got to this distribution. And if it's far away from this distribution, this will mean that you've got cha a chance to have actual colocalization. So this is, a, this is a, another, uh, another way to work with images when you've got uh, only one experimental situation. But be careful because getting numbers out of the images is fine. But it's fine also, it's like with the ring circle uh, paradigm that I've been talking about. Uh, it's important to have several informations and to combine the informations before stating about colocalization. Because if you are looking at this slide, you will see that the percentage of colocalization in terms of surface 
is the same, but it doesn't correspond exactly to the same experimental condition. Here you've got an overlap. Here you've got only part of the green signal that is engaged in the colocalization process. Here you've got a bigger uh, colocalization uh, area, but a bigger object. Even though if you're measuring the Mender's coefficient here, you will find exactly the same. And finally, you've got the reverse situation. So it's important not only to focus on the indicator on the matrix from uh, colocalization, but maybe to widen a bit the analysis so that you're sure about, that you're comparing or describing exactly the same phenomenon. So what question should you address? Knowing the metrics that I've been presenting and the comparison and interpretation method that uh, I've been presenting. What type of colocalization method is the most appropriate for your problematic? Are you working on the intensities? Or are you working on physical uh, coincidence? Are the published methods adapted to your problematic? Yes, because this is not because you, you find Pearson coefficient, Mender's coefficient in all confocal softwares, in all image processing software that, is, that are linked to the microscope, in all the publications that these are the methods that you should use. Maybe, maybe, maybe a different metric will be more adapted to your specific problematic. So depending on the intels that you will, uh, you, you, you will uh, give, if the answer is no, you've got to be creative to build your own metric, to characterize it and to use it and publish it. Uh, well, if you're happy, if your problematic works on your specific problematic, if, 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 the, if the method that have been published work on your specific problematic, and if, if this is okay, then fine. Just go and find the tool that is the most appropriate uh, for your workflow, uh, especially if colocalization is only one part of the workflow. You've got to be able to chain all the steps so that you can automatize and remove the bias, uh, the human, human bias in the analysis. About the tools, we've been uh, writing uh, a review with Patrice Mascalki. Uh, and at the end of this review, you will find a table where you have some kind of list of all the, of a lot of tools that exist and when to, to which, what, what kind of uh, colocalization that allow you to, to do and where to, to, to find them. Do we have questions? Um, here again, I would say yes, we, we do have questions. Um, for example, one that I, that I like is uh, we have someone wanted to do a colocalization between three channels or three objects. Uh, do you have recommendations? Mm, well, most of the tools that exist are done for only two channels, but once more, uh, you, you will, if it's, if it's trying to find uh, the overlap between the, the three, then uh, one of the workflows that I will present after will, will help. It's, it, it will just have to be generalized to the third channel. Then, then well, if you're working on the intensities, uh, I think that the easiest way will be to go two by two mm -hmm. with, with the tools that exist. Uh, but if you're willing to implement, uh, for instance, the Pearson coefficient, I'm uh, for sure you can uh, extend it to to three dimensions. So, but I'm not sure that we've got an implementation that already exists about that. My answer would also be that it will be difficult to make it uh, understandable by uh, viewers after because 2D scatter plots is already challenging sometimes. Yeah. But then if we make 3D graph, uh, yeah, it will be difficult. Yeah, you, you know, for the 3D graphs, the thing I would do is uh, use, 
there was a, a plugin, I can't remember the name, uh, to, to, to do these scatter plots on RGB images. Mm -hmm. There is an old plugin uh, about that. So uh, this could we'll, be a start point. We'll find it for the post on the forum. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can continue um, for the moment. Okay. Thanks, Fabrice. OK. So this is a final section. And in fact, it's just few few examples, really basic examples, just to show you that colocalization study has not to be complex. And that by thinking about, about the elements, the individual tools that you may put together, uh, all the tools that exist within uh, ImageJ, you may already uh, have your workflow set to do what you, you want to do. This is a, this is a true story with a, a user who came to the facility with this kind of labeling with cells, to cells that are labeled in red and green. And the idea is to identify the, the, the ones that are carrying the marker a only, B only, and both A and B. So the question is how to isolate each single cell, how to count, count each type of cell, and how to estimate the percentage of co-expressing cell. You see, this is not the colocalization, the subcellular colocalization, as a lot of us uh, think about. This is, this is still colocalization, but Colocalization is not the right word to, to characterize this situation. This is called co-expression. So first, how to isolate the individual cells. Uh, of course, on this kind of image, the thing I would like to do is to set a threshold, to identify the background and differentiate it from the object, uh, but how? How would I do? How, how would I do it, especially on the on the on the on the yellow cells? There there are methods. You just open image and you will see that there are plenty of methods uh, that exist to set a threshold. Are they appropriate to these problematics? I don't know. But this was a good opportunity to give you uh, this. Uh, an explanation about a method that uh, that exists that is implemented in uh, in Jacob, which is a cost auto automatic threshold. What cost automatic threshold will do is first do a scatter plot of all the intensities, and in fact, it will uh, put a threshold as high as possible to start with. And it will look at the Pearson coefficient below here. And if this Pearson coefficient is still uh, non-zero, then it means that down there, here, there is still a bit of correlation, of, uh, of correlation. Then it will move the threshold down a bit. Have a look at the Pearson coefficient. If there is still a correlation, it will move the threshold down, 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 until it reaches this step where you see this big cloud is uncorrelated. So now we can set up the threshold here, which maximizes the number of pixels uh, carrying, uh, having, uh, having a correlation of uh, intensities and lowering as much as possible the uncorrelated uh, population. So this is one way to set automatically a threshold where you twist already the problem by trying to maximize here the, the number of pixels that you, you take, you take into account, and pixels that, are, are, that have intensity that are correlated. I'm not sure this applies really well to this problematic where you've got co-expression. It's not said that you've got a correlation of intensity between the two. But uh, I thought this was a good moment to tell you about possible ways to, to, to set thresholds. On this image, the thing I would do is try to get the two masks, a mask with red cells, a mask with green cell. 
And simply by using some uh, binary combination between red and green, I will have the double express cells, the cells that are the yellow cells, the ones that are carrying red and green intensity. Then the double express cells, I will, I will use them and I will remove them in a way from the red mask to have the red only cells. Of course, I will have small crappy little things that I will filter out later on. I will do exactly the same for the green mask to have the green only cells. And finally, I will recombine the three. I will be able using, for instance, analyzed particles in MAJ to count the double expressors, the red only cells and the green only cells. And you see, no Manders coefficient, no fancy Pearson, no fancy randomization and so on, simply by regular uh, tools that you can find in image, you can do the colocalization workflow and have the numbers uh, at the end. Another, uh, another uh, workflow, which will be the last one, uh, more related to super resolution. Uh, of course, with super resolution microscopy, you end up with a lot of detections. So small crosses, each represent a detection. And you see that there is something happening here. It seems that there is, you, you don't have cross, crosses overlapping, so, but you seem to have a distribution that is related between the green and the red channel. So how can I do to prove that here I've got some relationship between the, the two signals? Uh, how to do colocalization on that? Well, you've got three choices. The first one is to take a good old Gaussian blur or to take the PSF, the point spread function, to convolve the image to have this blurry image where you can do all the measurements that we've seen previously. But what is the point to do super resolution if, uh, to, if to quantify colocalization, you should go back so for sure you should adapt the method that uh, you're using. Maybe you need to uh, define the zone of influence of each single detection and to do some kind of tessellation and then work on the ties on how they overlap and so on. This is one way to, to proceed. The other way would be to work on special uh, statistics and to evaluate the relationship between the two distribution. And I must say that I'm not an expert on that field, but we know two experts on that field. So Florian and Thibault, who will give you the seminar next week. So if you want to, to know precisely how they would process this type of images, so join us on the, on, on the next seminar. Finally, word of advice, colocalization is dangerous. Because, well, if you're not using the appropriate method uh, in, in the, the application uh, field it, it was made for, uh, you may end up with, with, really, with, with numbers that won't mean anything or will screw the full story of your paper. But you might be inventive, you might know the tools, you might know the tools for colocalization, the tools that you may find in image, and try to think, sit down, and try to invent your really own way to do colocalization. Of course, you will have to, to test it to make sure that uh, the method that you came up with is, is, um, is be behaving the way you're expecting. So, well, last advice, when doing colocalization, think, be creative, test, get help, and repeat until you, you, you end up with a, a, good, a, a good process. And that's the end of the talk. So I'm pretty sure that we still have a few, few questions. Thank you, Fabrice. Um... Yeah, I th I think we we do have some questions. Um, I I found the color inspector. Was it the one you were thinking That's about? It. That's Great. it. 
Um, there is, yeah, there is also questions regarding um, a creative uh, way of doing analysis. <laughs> Can, so I will try to uh, to say it out loud. Uh, can you assign objects to groups based on their degree of colocalization? E.g., object A is colocalized to object one and two, but a higher volume of A. So you see, it's going to be crazy. Um, so I think you you, you mentioned it. You, you can do whatever you want as long as you document it, explain it, explain your choices, and explain why you are doing it. Sure, sure, sure. And you see, you see with the development of uh, networks like Nubia as well, we are training a lot of new, newbie in uh, image uh, processing and, uh, and uh, we are uh, training people to, to do their own macros and so on. For sure, for sure, this these things, so creating new methods and also assessing that they are working really well, testing with, with uh, generating some uh, um, synthetic data sets on which you, you may uh, test the method is something that be is becoming easy. And I'm quite surprised to see that we are all going back into the same things. So Pearson, Manders, uh, I don't know which one to, to use, so I will open Jacob, tick all the boxes, and pick the one method that works for me, which is just stupid. Just have a look at your images and try to, to, to describe what you, try to, to, to see what you want to describe on a biological point of view, and then try to build the metric that will reflect this, and try to see if this is responding the way you're expecting. Uh, and so on, and uh, work on synthetic uh, images to uh, be able to vary all parameters and see if the metrics that you've built is, is actually responding. And I would say maybe if you feel alone uh, and lost in this uh, colocalization world, maybe do not hesitate to post on the image forum. Maybe look if there is a similar question first and then post on the forum. Maybe yeah. one of us will help you with that. I don't know, Marion or Anna or Thibaut, did, did you see a question that I forgot to ask, but that will be very interesting to, uh, to ask right now? So uh, I'd like to do a question. I'm sorry. So just report a question from a user. Um, so you exposed how from the facility point of view, you would do analysis of colocalization. Um, and question from user was, how do you convince users that maybe they are not aware of these uh, uh, different tools uh, that effectively there is colocalization? So what is the suggestion, the trick you usually use? You, you present them with other paper, other things they can find in uh, literature or, you know, opinion leader in the field? Or what do you do? Thank you. Uh, what do I do? What do I do when I've got a user coming to the facility and asking for colocalization? Uh, I would say, first, I, 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 will, I will listen to the user uh, about his, uh, the problematics, the biological uh, problematics. Uh, then I will ask for images to know the kind of structure he is uh, working on. Uh, depending on that, can I summarize the problem as dots, or is it, uh, is it what is the shape and uh, and so on? And then I will assess the quality of the images. Sometimes, uh, even if we are uh, an, an image facility that takes into the full process into into account, sometimes when the user becomes alone uh, in front of the microscope then it degrades the, the quality of the image. And then, then, then once I've got everything okay, then we start to work on the, on the metric. And if the user is not convinced, then this is, this, is, this is a problem. In general, this is not the user that is not convinced because the user will have uh, read all the papers about colocalization before coming to me. This is a PI in general that is uh, that might say, okay, you should do Pearson. Yeah, well, you don't have any correlation between your intensities, so this is a bit stupid. So sometimes, yeah, making a bit uh, 
uh, I've got a set of papers that I sent to the user to be sent to uh, the PI, uh, but I didn't have to directly send to the PI yet. Uh, maybe, maybe in my former lab. <laughs> Does it, is it a kind of uh, answer you are looking for? Yeah, I think it's enough, thank you. Anna, Marion, Thibault, do you see any questions you would like to to cover right now? All good. So with that, we'll do our best to uh, fill uh, the gaps of all the questions we didn't answer uh, in the Q and A, and prepare the post on the on the forum. And with that, I would like to uh, to <laughs> thank Fabrice again. Uh, th thanks to, to you who have been uh, typing uh, <laughs> answers and, to the questions. And, and thank you also to the Creek uh, team who uh, solved the uh, technical issue in uh, no time. So we could start with uh, only a few minutes delay. That was uh, impressive also. So thank you guys. See you soon. Thank you.